So thanks again. So I, my name is Frank Gabel. I'm a physicist by training. I come from Germany originally, but I came to France in a university exchange with our partner university in Grenoble. So Grenoble is, is down here. It's at the height of Northern Italy. It often people forget this. We are south of Venice, for example. So it's, it's, it's amazing. So it's a nice place. We have mountains around it. And of course, from a scientific point of view, it's also great because you are here on the EPN campus, the European Photon and Neutron Campus. So which groups together uh, some nice institutions. So if you have the CIBB, we have the EMBL, we have the Synchrotron ESRF, and of course, what we do, what we like, what I will be talking about today, which is neutrons. So the ILL, uh, the well, very historically uh, one of the earliest neutron centers in Europe, and the first high flux high flux uh, neutron reactor here, and uh, which was really very important to do biological experiments. So I'm myself working at the IBS, the Institute for Structural Biology or Institut de Biologie Structurale in French, which is a new building now. We were outside the campus. We moved there uh, some um, little bit less than 10 years ago in this nice building, which is really uh, close to the entrance here and in walking distance to all these facilities. So I, I, I learned that there, there's a second lecture on small angle neutron scattering. So I, I'll therefore limit my introduction to the technique to 10, 15 minutes at the beginning, and Susanna Teixeira will will um, go in depth in the in the technique itself. But I will be necessary that I introduce some basic concepts of uh, small angle neutron scattering so that you understand what I'll be talking about. So the idea is I give you a short introduction to small angle neutron scattering, and then I show you two practical examples uh, from the um, um, domain of of uh, protein degradation. So two practical examples where we apply the small angle neutron scattering. And you learn tomorrow more on the theory and on the practical things like to fit data and so on with, with Susanna. So the brief introduction to small angle uh, neutron scattering. So this is a, a structural biology technique. You know, there are a couple of them. So biological objects in principle, you can be interested in understanding their structure and function at different hierarchical levels. So this is from a biology textbook. You have, of course, the, the level of the organism the level then of of, um, of, um, of 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 smaller details here you go down by a factor of 10 uh, in length scales here, here the fingerprints and it's of course with the usual uh, your, your natural senses like the eyes you cannot get down, down uh, in this scale very uh, low so for example here you would be able to see of course uh, your finger your fingerprints the ribbles and so on but your resolution of your eye stops somewhere a factor of 10 above what would allow you to see actually the cells in your body. So you see, this is the level of the cells then. Then you have the, the level of the organelles. Here's a mitochondrion. Then you come to the macromolecules. Here's the ribosomes. It's a single ribosome. And then of course the autotomic level. So historically people were able to go down and see more details. So there is a light microscope that is invented. Then uh, later, of course, NMR, crystallography, electron microscopy, which joined now this club of techniques, restricted um, number of techniques, which allow you to go to atomic details. So electron microscopy in favorable cases, NMR in favorable cases, crystallography, when you can crystallize things. So this allows you to go to atomic resolution. It allows you to see where the atoms sit in each, uh, in each macromolecule. Uh, small angle neutron scattering is somewhere in between. So you see from a scale from maybe 10 angstroms to about a thousand angstroms. So it's very nicely uh, situated to see, uh, to resolve uh, the, the shape of macromolecules. Unfortunately, it will not allow you to go to atomic detail. So you cannot obtain an atomic structure by small angle scattering alone, but it allows you to probe certain models of your macromolecules in solution. So just a few basics on the technique. So Susanna will elaborate on this. Uh, this is a scattering technique. So you have some incoming radiation. It can be X-rays, or in our case today, neutrons, which are described as a plane wave. They will interact with the matter. So in the case of X-rays, it will interact with the electrons of your atoms. In the case of neutrons, it will interact with the nuclei. So with the uh, nuclei of, the, of your atoms, which means the protons, uh, neutrons, and so on. Since these objects, this, the nuclei are small with respect to the wavelengths. So the wavelength is a couple of angstroms. The nuclei, you know, the, the size of an 
atom is roughly, if a small atom like hydrogen is about an angstrom, but the nucleus is about a thousand times, 10,000 times smaller. So it's uh, much smaller. So you can consider this as a point like uh, obstacle that is in the way. And this means, of course, that all the, the waves are scattered from your nuclei are going out in a spherical way. So the idea is then you can do it in two ways. You can imagine um, it in um, as, as a, um, how to say, in a mathematical way. So you can, for the physicist among you, so this uh, you give a weight, this is a scattering length to each atom or to each nucleus, which measures the strength with which it interacts with the radiation. Then you have to take into account the phase and so on with which it is scattered. And then you have to sum up these waves. So there are some will be in phase, so they will add up as a function of where you are on the detector. Others will be out of phase, they will have a loss of signal. So I don't go into the details. Susanna will, 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 will elaborate on this. Just to say this wave phenomena is not only in the microscopic world, but it's also in the macroscopic world. And here you see it here to give you some flavor of hopefully a nice uh, summer holidays. This is a beach on the Adriatic coast in Italy. And you see here, I mean, ignore for the moment the the um, the tourists they are crystallizing under their umbrellas and avoiding radiation damage from the sun but focus here on the waves coming from the ocean so you have these boulders these rocks you have small openings and here the spherical waves so this is like a perturbation of the wave and there's a spherical wave going out and you see this nice pattern here on the beach so it happens also in real life and this is the idea how you can describe all this in practice so the other way is not thinking mathematically but thinking graphically adding up these waves and seeing what is the signal. Now a word on why the small angle scattering. The principle is the same as in crystallography, but the sample state is different. So there are individual proteins in solution. There's not a regular arrangement in the crystal lattice. So you have all the waves that are scattered from a single object, a single protein, for example. And then you have to count how these waves add up at a certain point on your detector. If the object is small, as you go away from the direct beam forward scattering direction, as you go away a little bit, you see here the waves that will get out of phase very quickly. So there will be destructive interference. The signal will get weaker very, uh, will, will, be, will get weaker uh, slowly. So you, you have to go a, a quite a bit away, sorry. You have to go back quite a bit away from the direct beam because the object is small and the difference between the phases of the wave scattered uh, is determined by this distance here, okay? So if you have a small object, small with respect to the wavelength, you have to go quite a bit away in order to have destructive interference. So a small object, small meaning small with respect to the wavelength, which is a couple of angstroms for neutrons, would mean the intensity is very strong in the forward scattering direction because all the waves are in phase, they add up the intensity. And then as you go away slowly from the direct uh, uh, forward scattering direction, the uh, intensity of the scattering object will go down. Now imagine you have a bigger object, a bigger protein with respect to wavelength. Let's say this is lysozyme. This is a big object like a ribosome. You are, have big distances with respect to the wavelengths. This means big distances. If you go already a little bit away from the direct beam, it means these scattered waves at points, different positions within the object, they get out of phase very quickly. This means as you go away from the direct beam, the scattering intensity will drop very quickly. And you see this here, so the curve number two here down is from a bigger object. And this means this is a so-called reciprocal relationship between real space, meaning the size of your object, distances in the object, and the reciprocal space, what you will observe on a detector, okay? So this means a very small object has a scattering curve that goes to higher angles. A big object has a scattering curve that comes down very quickly. And you can uh, make this in, to bring this to extremes. If you're a mathematician, you see this is a Fourier transform of the object in three dimension. This means a point-like object, a point-like object, the Fourier transform of a point-like object is a constant. So if your object is an atom or something much smaller than the wavelength, the scattering of this object will be just on the on the detector a flat line. On the other hand, if your object becomes bigger and bigger, macroscopic sky size, it's so big that it's for the neutron, it's an infinite, infinite object. The Fourier transform of an infinite flat object is a delta function or point-like function. So all the scattering will go in the forward scattering direction. These are the two extremes. And then you can describe this mathematically. I, I leave this to Susanna's talk. 
Now, a few words on sample conditions. You can measure your uh, preferred biological system. It can be proteins, RNA, DNA, lipids, and so on. And also soft matter, of course. Uh, colloids and th things like that are used for, for small angle scattering. But you need a, a couple of milligrams per milliliter concentration-wise. And then the volume typically we have here at ILL on D22 would be of the order of 200 microliters. So let's say a couple of hundred microliters of volume and uh, the concentration of your system, uh, a couple of milligrams per milliliter. Now, as I said, the sample state is important. It's not a crystal. It means normally your macromolecules are oriented. Their orientation is arbitrary. Assuming that the orientation of one macromolecule does not influence the orientation of another macromolecule, okay? This means you have an isotropic arrangement in all different orientations possible of your macromolecules in solution. And this isotropic orientation leads to an isotropic pattern on your on your um, on your screen or on your detector, this means this point of symmetry is the direct beam here. And then, as you go away in different directions, you have the same average loss. Of course, there are statistical fluctuations on how the neutrons are actually scattered. But on average, you have um, uh, the same loss if you go up here, down to the left, to the right. As you go away from the direct beam, the loss will be the same on average. This means you don't lose information if you sum up here concentric rings of intensity. You just define a distance from the direct beam, a scattering angle or a wave vector transfer. And then you have an intensity that decreases as a one dimensional curve. And that's the information you get from small angle scattering. It will be in general for isotropic systems, a one dimensional curve intensity as a function of angle. Now, as I said, when you add very small angles means in real space, you add at bigger distances. This means at very small angles, you have some average information on the whole integrating on the whole uh, macromolecule. These are global properties. You will get, be able to get the molecular weight of your macromolecule, and you will be able to get something that's called a radius of saturation, which is a measure of the distribution of uh, your atoms in your system. A radius of saturation will be big. If the system is stretched in something elongated, it will be small. If it's very compact, like a sphere-like structure. Now we can measure roughly everything here from single amino acids. If you lay, want to get a radius of duration of a single amino acid, it's possible, up to very big objects, the biggest objects, uh, macromolecular objects like um, viruses, ribosomes, and so in the order of the megadalton range. Now, the globally the information provided by small scan is oligomeric state of macromolecules, the shape of the molecules is the uh, does it look like a banana, like an apple, does it look like a donut, like a potato? You get information on the interaction between different macromolecules. You could titrate a partner or ligand and see how the mass of the object, what is the stoichiometry, what is the conformational change if you have partners interacting. And the, the nice thing, of course, is you work in solutions. So you will play around with your solvent conditions. You can work with pH, salt, uh, ligands, temperature, pressure, and so on. So that's a nice thing. You can look how your system reacts under these different conditions. Now, the important point for neutrons, more widely used in neutrons than for X-rays, is so-called contrast variation, which allows you in more complex system composed of several partners to focus on the signal of individual partners. Now, globally, of course, you can go, go do more than just the molecular mass or the radius of duration. There's also some modeling. I won't go into too much detail. I will show you the practical examples later. Now, what can SUNS do with respect to SACS? So remember, X-ray SACS uh, observes electron density. The problem is that the electron density of the different objects in macromolecules are not too different. And another problem in, um, you cannot work, uh, influence a lot the solvent density uh, of, for, for X-rays. So the water solvent density, the electron density of the solvent. You can do more things in neutrons. So what do I mean by this? Imagine you do some modeling of a large complex composed of several proteins, the blue, the red, the green, the yellow one. You will get something like an envelope for this. It looks like low resolution uh, electron microscopy. You will get some envelope of this. But the problem will then be, uh, where do the individual partners sit within the envelope? Okay, is the green protein really here or is it sitting here and so on? So if X-rays, uh, you wouldn't be able to distinguish this. Because on average, the electron density of all proteins, even though the, the sequence might be different, it's, it's uh, very similar and you cannot distinguish them. So you, by X-rays, you can distinguish globally the signal from one protein at low resolution from the other. You can by neutrons. 
And you can this by changing the interaction with the neutrons. And how do you do this? You have to change the nuclei because neutrons, they interact with the nuclei of the, of the, of the proteins. This means you have to do deuteration. So this is the idea of contrast variation. Here's an example from some women from a, a tribe in Africa with the traditional, um, traditional clothes and in front of this background, so getting invisible in a certain way. And you can calculate this. I won't go into details, just saying here. So Susanna will take more time to explain this. So by changing now the solvent properties, scattering properties for neutrons, by changing normal water H2O against heavy water, which is D2O with deuterium instead of hydrogen, you do change the properties how neutrons interact with them. Because neutrons, you can imagine that a neutron interacts differently with a single proton, which would be a hydrogen atom, or with a deuterium, which is a hydrogen plus a, plus a neutron in the nucleus, okay? So there is principally a difference in how it interacts. So you can then trace these things. You have a certain baseline here for the water going from normal water H2O to heavy water D2O. And then you have the scattering properties of individual macromolecules here for neutron, for, for proteins, for RNA and so on. And the nice thing is that they are different. So RNA scatters differently with neutrons because its chemical composition is different and especially the density of uh, hydrogen atoms. And then again, the scattering properties for lipids are different. So you have the possibility then to, to distinguish these different partners. There are then special points here where the water baseline crosses the line of a protein. This means here is something called the scattering length density. So if the scattering length density of the solvent is the same as that of the protein, it means the neutron can no longer distinguish between the scattering that happens in the solvent and then happens in the macromolecules. This means the protein becomes invisible. And this it happens around 40% D2O in a, in a solvent. So at 40%, roughly D2O in a solvent, depends on the protein sequence, your protein will become invisible. And this means then you, you can focus on other parts of the system, for example. Now here, just a graphic, uh, an um, analogon from refraction. So this is refraction from uh, light. You have a plexiglass rod. You would see it here in, in the air and then underwater. But then if you add, for example, glycerol, which changes the refractive index of the solvent, at some stage, you see the plexiglass rod, it becomes invisible um, underwater. Now, um, would it be possible with x-rays? So here um, is the situation of x-rays on top of it. So normally you would find in literature values like electrons per angstrom cube, which is an electron density that characterizes the system. Here I express it in scattering density, which is again a measure of how strongly the x-rays interact with the system. And here you see, of course, also electron density. You know RNA has this phosphate backbone and so on. So it's much richer in electron density than proteins. So there's different level, that's all right. The problem is that you can no longer um, make all the partners invisible by X-rays because you would have to change the electron density. You would have to reach the same electron density as a protein in water, which is lower. And it's even more difficult or almost impossible to, to reach a, an electron density as high as that of RNA. So there's no possibility nowadays with X-rays to do this contrast variation as you can do it with neutrons. And see here, neutrons going from H2 to D2O, you can cover all the range of these interesting molecules, RNA, DNA, protein, uh, detergent, lipids, and so on. Now, a few words how this would work. You imagine you have a protein RNA complex. Uh, as I said, RNA has a, has a bigger contrast than a protein here at 0% D2O. You would have a black object representing the RNA. And if you have two protein partners in the complex, there would be gray objects in front of a white background with 100% H2O in normal water. Coming to around 40, 42% D2O, the protein would become invisible and you would only see the RNA. This means really you see the RNA as it is bound in the complex. So it's not free RNA, that's important. So you could, by comparing this image here with this image, you could see if there are some conformational changes if you measure the RNA alone or if you measure it in the presence of the protein, that's important. It's the assembled complex. And then if you go to a higher degree of D2O, around 70% D2O, depending again on the RNA composition, the RNA here becomes invisible and you see only the signal from the protein. So this is also possible, I was saying at the beginning with X-rays, you can distinguish between two proteins. In principle, with neutrons, you can't either because the uh, chemical composition is the same for normal proteins. 
but you can do deuteration. And so when we build duration, you will hear about this. So this is exchanging the hydrogen atoms by deuterium atoms in, in, your, in your protein. So this is chemically, you grow bacteria instead of media. So we'll hear about this, I guess, later in, in the course. The point is then that you can distinguish one protein from another. Imagine you have a deuterated protein, a hydrogenated protein, you reassemble them in the complex. You can mask the signal of the hydrogenated protein at around 40% D12. You will still see the deuterated protein. Then you can go to a certain point at 100% D12, where you come close to the matching point of a deuterated protein. You do not reach it really, because the deuterated protein has a stronger, has a, a bigger scattering length density. But there are special protocols you will also, I guess, hear about, which allow you to adjust the level of deuteration of your protein in such a way that it comes down a little bit, let's say 75%. And then you bring this line down. This means you can then mask the signal of this partially deuterated protein in 100% D12. And then you can look on the hydrogenated part. Radius of tracing, I jumped this. So we have spent uh, 15, 20 minutes with theory. And now I come to these practical examples. And again, there will be hands out, handouts of my lectures and, and you can also discuss this later or interrupt me if you like. So I'll show two practical examples now on systems that are started in our group as Bruno Franzetti's ELMA group, extremophile, extremophiles and large molecular assemblies here at IBS. And uh, so I'll show two examples, one static example where the system is not changing with time and then a time resolved sun studies. And uh, the question is, of course, with respect to other techniques, what is the unique insight that these neutrons or small angle neutron scattering can get, provide for these systems? Now, what is this protein degradation in cells? What's the general um, topic? Now you have uh, different cells in your organism or even single cellular organisms. They are not static over time. Of course, their composition, uh, they are, of course, their morphology changes over time, but also the content in certain protein species as a function of where they are in their life cycle. So if there's growing, dividing, if there's external stress, temperature change, uh, nutrients, uh, nutrients are coming and so on. Or if you have uh, at the early stage in your organism developments or cell differentiation, will your cell become a muscle cell? Will it turn into a brain cell and so on? So the global content in proteins and the structures of course is varying a lot. So this proteome that is the ensemble of proteins in the cell needs to be produced it needs to be controlled, the quality. And uh, at some stage, if it's no longer needed or if there are some, some other things happening, it needs to be destroyed in a controlled way, okay, and recycled. So of course, there are several levels of control. You have gene expression. You may know this if you come from biology, of course, how proteins are produced specifically and so on, are they activated, their production. But then also you need specific degradation and I'll talk more about this. And of course, you can imagine if these things go wrong, they're all kind of bad things happening, tumors, neurodegenerative diseases, um, aggregation, fibrillation, and so on, aging, of course, also, which is, well, it's not a disease, it happens to everyone, but it might happen in, in, in an uncontrolled way. Now here, a uh, uh, general uh, image uh, um, overview of this. So you have this, all these regulatory uh, information, um, process going on at uh, production of proteins, then also the quality control. If there are some slight misfolding, there are some kind of repairing uh, mechanisms available in the cells or about these chaperone systems and so on. So they will then re-backfold the proteins in a certain way. But then if a protein needs to be specifically destroyed, there also is mechanism. So the first major player of this is the proteasome system. It recognizes specifically the proteins to be to be destroyed, they are uh, labeled in the case of eukaryotes, you may have heard about this ubiquitin system, and all for uh, lower organisms like archaea mechanisms, archaeal mechanisms, and bacterial mechanisms. There are small so-called degrons, this means small sequences in, in your proteins that uh, the, the proteasome recognizes specifically, and then attracts it to it, and uh, then uh, drags it into this proteolytic chamber to degrade them. What comes out are smaller oligopeptide pieces of uh, sequences. And then there's a second class of systems like they're called the peptidases. They take into a charge the smaller oligopeptides. They can be of the order of 10, 15 um, um, uh, amino acids in, in length, and then cutting it down into smaller pieces. So my first talk will, will be a static um, uh, sun study on this lower part of the system, on the, on the so-called TET system. 
And the second part of my talk will be a time resolve study on the upper part on the proteasome system. Now, the first uh, example. So we're working in with archaeal systems in our group. Archaea are the third kingdom of life. So they're not, not bacteria. So they are bacteria, archaea, and then uh, eukaryotes, OK? So and these are from extremophilic organisms. It's uh, in this case, Pyrococcus horikoshi, which is small beast like this. It lives close in the, in the uh, down in, in the bottom of the oceans, close to these hydrothermal well, uh, vents. So it's a very extreme environment, high pressure, high temperature. So these are very robust systems. I mean, of course, there's a global interest in, on how these uh, organisms involved in, in the in the context of the origin of life, but I, I not focus on this today. So it's more on the biophysical properties for the structural biology community. Often they, they work with these um, proteins or macromolecular systems from the extremophilic organisms because they have a certain number of advantages for structural biology. They are robust, as I said, stable at high temperature and so on. So this is this TAT system. So this is one of these peptidate systems that degrades these uh, species of oligopeptides into smaller uh, single amino acids. OK, it looks like it's a dodecameric uh, edifice. It has uh, some openings here where the peptides will enter and uh, then go out again. And the catalytic site is buried in the, in the middle. There are several catalytic sites that are buried in the middle. So it's a, it's a big system. It's 500 kilodaltons. It was discovered in about 20 years ago years ago and uh, it's uh, they, they come in different flavor these uh, monomeric building blocks with certain specificities towards certain amino acid residues okay so there's a so-called tet2 uh, system which is more sensitive to cleave uh, neutral uh, amino acids and then there's a tet3 system which more um, evolved to, to cleave basic uh, uh, amino acids so my colleagues, by doing biochemistry, they found out a, a strange thing. So the, the catalytic site, I should say, is here on the apex. So you have it here in the, in the, in the larger view. There are three catalytic sites on, on each apex. Okay, it comes in and then it's, it's cleaved here. So my colleagues, they found out some, some, some strange thing. They were mixing uh, homododecameric uh, TET2 particles with homododecameric TET3 particles in the solution. And then they were also assembling a certain kind of uh, hybrid system, so a hetero uh, heterododecameric systems, but in the same stoichiometry. So in the solution, you have the same concentration and same stoichiometry of TET1 subunits and TET2 subunits. They are just assembled in a different way. So here it's a mixture of two of homododecameric particles and here a mixture of hybrid particles, okay? So what they found out is that the efficiency of the system is uh, increased if you have these hetero oligomeric particles. The question is of then, of course, uh, how, why is a heterododecameric particle at the same stoichiometry of, of the catalytic sites and so on more efficient than this mixture of homododecameric particles? And what do these uh, heterododecameric particles in the solution look like? Now, to study this, you, you might imagine we used suns and contrast variation. So the idea is now we would uh, deuterate one of the partners, in our case, TET2 and let the other one, the TET3 one, uh, hydrogenate it, which would allow us then to mask the units from the TET3 uh, at about 40, 42% D2O. And having uh, applied this um, match out labeling so that the particle, the deuterated particle becomes invisible at 100% D2O, which was developed at the, at the D lab at ILL. So there's some reference here. You would be able to match everything deuterated at 100% D2O. Now, what is the idea now? My colleagues were constructing, uh, assembling these heterododecameric particles in solution. So you can imagine there are different topologies. We knew that the building plot is a, is a homo, uh, homodimer. So it's on the crest here of this uh, tetrahedral particle, but there are several uh, different possibilities you can think of. So you could have a single uh, dimer deuterated in the particle. You could have two dimers. You could have three dimers deuterated, but they can come in in different topologies. And with normal techniques, even mass spec, it's very difficult to distinguish these cases. Of course, the mass is the same of this object. You have six deuterated partners and uh, six hydrogenated one, and here the same, but the internal topology looks different. You can't distinguish it by sucks because the TET2 and TET3 are very similar, so it's, it's, very, it's very tricky. Now, the idea is you could 
think of this topology you measured in solution, you would measure it in small, small, small angle neutron scattering, you would measure it 42% D2O to mask the signal of the hydrogenate partner, look at the structure of the deuterate partner, and then do the inverse, measure it at 100% D2O and look at the hydrogenate partner, not seeing the deuterate partner. So we are purifying this and then measuring in solution. And these are all the possible uh, topologies you can think of, apart from, of course, the homo dodecameric two extremes, which I do not show here. And then uh, what do actually the scattering curves look like? So if you measure these different objects, you can calculate it for these topologies. If you do an in silico reconstruction of your um, heterododecameres, and you can fit it with uh, programs against experimental data. And you see in some cases of these topologies, the fit is good. In others is medium. So what I call yellow is maybe, maybe, and here green is, is a good fit in terms of a chi-square value. So it, it says how well the theoretical curves agrees with your experimental curve. But it's not enough, as you see, to distinguish which one is it actually. It could be this one, this one, this one. So you have to look at other data. You have to look at 42%, 70%, 100%. So if you do it, you see this here. At 42%, you mask everything that is light gray. In 100%, you mask everything that is dark gray. And in the 70%, you're in between the two of them. And of course, your system, your actual system in solution, it must be in agreement with all your experimental data. So it's supposed to stay the same. It's a very robust particle. If it's in 100% D2 and 0% D2 or in between, the topology and the assembly of the particle stays the same. So the actual topology that you're looking for is the one that must be in agreement with all your experimental data. And as you see here, everything is green. There's only one case possible. And this is called what we call this Z-like particle because here the arrangement of these uh, label dimers is a Z-like structure. So there's really a unique power here of suns to look into inside this complex particle and get the topology of the individual of the different two different partners. Now you have here a little bit more data, a more detailed fit here. You see it's, it's relatively nice. Here's some noise level and maybe background from the direct beam. But overall here, this structure fits very well um, the, 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 the curve. Now we have also this P of R function. So Susanna will, will maybe introduce this in more detail. This is a measure for the distances between different atoms in the system and here, there's something very weird if you hear about this uh, later in your in your in your PhD or so on. If you do Sachs data, normally the P of R function has also positive values because all the electron densities in your protein is above the one of the solvent. But here we have the case where some of the in the 70% data you have some of the deuterated the, you have the deuterated particles that have positive contrast, the hydrogenated ones have negative contrast. You have your very weird and funny and funny P of R function that are very rich on the information you get on the internal structure. Now, uh, going further, we have uh, now um, also complemented this study with um, uh, cryoEM. So we have detected by cryoEM there are certain intermediate um, uh, structures, open structures, which are not dodecameric structures, but hexameric structures in some kind of uh, freeze in the, in the assembly during the assembly mode. So we see that there are certain intermediate um, forms before the full assembly of the complex. And the idea is we use this information, combine it with the small angle Newton scattering. So my student, uh, Alex, had prepared a small movie here. I hope this you can, can see the movie. So there is the building block. It's a, a homodimer, can be either TET2 or TET3. It comes together with other uh, homodimers, forming either a closed intermediate a hexameric structure or an open uh, intermediate hexameric structure. So normally the two units should move, but but my student uh, did the simplified way, so there should be some some symmetry here. Then you have so this uh, hexameric intermediate structure that it was this is a cryoM uh, structure here. Then there would be the second intermediate uh, hexameric structure coming from the complementary TET particles, so either TET two or TET three. The two would come together. And they would form now this double Z-like structure in the fully assembled um, dodecameric final uh, model. Okay, so the idea is you can then with this intermediate information on the assembly pathway and the final structure that is validated nicely by the suns, this heterododecameric um, uh, double set structure, 
you can then speculate on the assembly pathway and you can exclude certain hypotheses of the assembly which would uh, end up with this kind of uh, topology which we did not observe by our science data so only this one is valid so the nice thing is also that in this very special structure compared to these two other possibilities you see each catalytic pocket which brings together uh, which is composed as a hetero catalytic body this means you have one catalytic site here from the light gray particle you have two catalytic sites from the dark gray particle so tet2 tet3 they're complementary remember the first slide one is more against neutral the other against basic amino acid residues and cleaving so you would uh, assemble in each uh, catalytic pocket a hetero catalytic specificity so we group them together locally uh, complementary um, a catalytic sites and this we believe is the reason why this particle here the heterododecameric particle assembled is more efficient in cleaving uh, these uh, longer um, uh, oligopeptide substrates in the end so this is a combined sans em and crystallography study because we had the single building blocks which we combined in silico for the sun study from crystallography so this was the first part of my lecture, a static sun structure, which allows you to look inside a complex assembled um, multi-protein um, complex. The second part is time-resolved suns, and it's about this uh, upstream, what's happening upstream. We, are, we, are now dealing, we were dealing with these oligopeptides, but how do you get these oligopeptides? So the oligopeptides you get from the proteasome particle. A proteasome is a very big object. It's of the order of two megadalton for eukaryotes. And it's really big. So you have this ubiquitin labeling to the polypeptide chains here in, in the, the, the proteins uh, that are here in, in dark red. Uh, and uh, you see in over the past three, four, five years with the cryoM re uh, revolution, you have enormous sophisticated models coming out of this. So there was enormous progress in the understanding of the function of all this. And even people were able to to, um, to um, get um, atomic resolution models of the blocked substrate. So not only of the proteasome alone, but also in the presence of the substrate. And you see here this, as it is being uh, unfolded here. So the, the upper part is the so-called, um, um, how to say, the regulatory particle. This is the one that recognizes the proteins to be degraded. It tears them, tears on them, so it unfolds them. And then it, it, it brings it down into the catalytic uh, uh, chamber here of the uh, catalytic core particle, okay? So there's in eukaryotes, there's a ubiquitin labeling and in, in other organisms like bacteria and, um, and archaea, they're just sequences on this uh, or surface motifs of the proteins to be degraded, okay? And so you have always a regulatory particle that recognizes specifically proteins to be degraded because you don't want all proteins unspecifically, of course, to be degraded. And then it guides them directly into the protein. So cryom has undergone this revolution and there are over the last two, three, four years, the enormous high quality structures. The point is of course the limitation, it's kind of static snapshots. So you see certain steps of this um, unfolding process, but you don't get a, a global picture of, of the overall process. So now for sun studies, this eukaryotic particle is too complex. There are dozens of different proteins. It's very fragile, so assembled and you need a homogenic uh, population and so on. Of course, in cryo, you can select families and so on. You cannot do this in suns. In suns, you see everything that is in solution. So the assembly, the labeling of this is, is, is enormously complex. So we're working with a more um, easier version of this. The easier version comes again from these archaeal extremophilic systems, now from Methanocalococcus yanashi, it's no longer pyrococcus. It's again an organism that lives, de lives, lives deep, down, deep down in the ocean at, at, at very high temperature. Again, it's a very robust compact particle. And also very recently here now, in, in parallel to our studies, there were also first cryoem structures uh, coming out at uh, some kind of intermediate resolution from this uh, particle. It's easier than the eukaryotic particle because here the PAN, the so-called PAN particle here, which is a regular particle in this case, it's a single species of amino acids. It's a hexamer, but it's always the same copy of the protein. Whereas here in the eukaryotic, you have tens of, of, of different proteins here. Again, for the core particle, which has also tens of particles, different proteins here, you have only two species that assemble here. So already, from the composition, it's easier, but also from, from the topology, it's easier. 
And the big advantage again for our sun study is that um, you can manipulate this. So you can, it's active at higher temperatures. It doesn't work at low temperatures. So the idea is now for the sun study, you can have the inactive particle at four degrees Celsius, and then you go to higher temperatures and you can activate the function. So you can use temperature as a, as a trigger for the reaction. I see there is a question in the chat. I'm not sure if I'm, okay, no, this is a general remark. Okay, so I, there's no, not yet a specific question, but feel free to, to interrupt. Now, let me move on. So again, you have uh, some kind of um, static uh, structures here at very good resolution for cryon, but the dynamic process, how do you study it? So again, a small angle Newton setting comes into that. So, well, maybe uh, a few remarks here again uh, to, to how the process goes. So these are specific motifs here. This is from a review from a, a famous group in the US. You have conformational change, unfolding subunit dissociation. You have certain surface motifs that are recognized then by the pan, which tears it, which draws it uh, by an ATP driven um, mechanism down. So you need some energy to unfold. That is why you need ATP it draws it down into this um, uh, catalytic chamber. So the idea is we would like to do a time resolved suns. And uh, if you remember, of course, um, so we would like to see this process. So we need a substrate uh, and the good substrate that has been validated by other groups and is nice because it's fluorescent is green fluorescent protein, GFP. Because you not, not cannot only study the structure of the protein, but if you do fluorescence in parallel, you also know something about the folding state of the protein. So our substrate was a certain labeled GFP, so a small tag on it that has been um, validated as a recognition motive for the pan, so that it can uh, dra draw, uh, can uh, drag down a part of the of the GFP uh, across this channel into the catalytic chamber. So we would like to study this system here in a time-resolved sun's way. So we would like to follow what's happening to the substrate over course of time, but also if there are conformational changes here, for example, in the pan a molecule over the course of time of unfolding. Now, in the first part of the project, we are doing the, the simplified version, only substrate GFP and only the unfold as pan, okay? So this was a, stu a study from my uh, joint ILL uh, IBS uh, PhD student, Ziad Ibrahim. And the idea is the following one. You want to look on the one hand on the substrate, on the other, you would like to, to watch what is going on with PAN during the reaction. So you need labeling again, because two are, both are proteins, you cannot distinguish them if they are unlabeled. So the idea was to, to have uh, one uh, experiment with deuterated GFP and the other with, hydro with hydrogenated uh, PAN and the other one with hydrogenated GFP and deuterated PAN. Then you need to activate the reaction by putting the sample at 55 to 60 degrees Celsius and uh, supplying ATP. And then you would like to follow uh, what's going on here uh, during the reaction. Now, for all these experiments, it's very important to have sample characterization. Before you do use these precious samples, labeled samples, uh, you have to produce proteins, you have to come up with the reaction mixture, you have to optimize um, temperature, ATP and so on. You have to characterize all this offline before you do the actual experiment and coming to a neutron center, okay? So you do uh, gel filtration experiments, you do, you do uh, biocore experiments to check the interaction, you check what happens at different ATP um, and other experimental conditions when is the sample uh, very monodispersed and so on. So you, you optimize all these things beforehand and it's very important also Often I recommend before going to a neutron center, do first an X-ray experiment to characterize the sample. You don't need labeling. So you, you learn already something, what happens to the system. Is there some dependence on concentration? Do the SACS experiments also in the normal way first, okay? Now, uh, second part now, we, we want to look what's on the labeling. So we are, we are watching here in this case, we are putting ourselves at around 42% D2O. We always mask the hydrogenated part of the system and we watch what's going on with the deuterated part. In this case, it was a perturated sample because we wanted to have a maximum signal over noise from the labeled part. Now we could have chosen the deuteration level a bit, a bit lower, it's less expensive, but the signal would have decreased. So the signal is always proportional to the square between this distance here between the two scattering length densities. So you make this, um, you do divide this by two, the, 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 the difference in scattering length, you divide the signal by four. Okay, so please, it's important something to be aware of. 
So of course we had to check that once the hydrogenate partner is really masked at the D2O level of the solvent we chose. So that's why we compared here deteriorated pan in the presence of hydrogenated GFP and it's to, to, you see the two scattering curves are the same. So the hydrogenated GFP does not contribute. You can also look at this individually. Here's the hydrogenated uh, GFP uh, and the buffer level. You have no signal. The same the other way around now, hydrogenated pan disappears in this 42% D2O uh, buffer. And again, the two scattering curves, if you combine deuterated GFP and deuterated GFP and hydrogenate pan, the hydrogenate pan is masked. So this is again a quality control and it's amazing because the GFP is about 28 kilodaltons in size and the pan system is more than 10 times bigger than this. So a single pan particle, again, the, the signal that the particle um, gives it goes with the square of the molecular mass. So it's very sensitive to big particles, uh, small angle Newton scattering. So these are all quality controls before the actual experiment. Now, we are, how is the ex actual experiment done? So the system is kept at ice at four degrees Celsius. And then it is put on into a sample rack that is uh, thermostated at uh, 55 degrees Celsius. If you put this in there, it will trigger the reaction. Remember, this is an extremophilic system, thermophilic system means at four degrees Celsius, the activity is very low, but at 55 degrees Celsius, it really turns quickly. So you put this in, you run out of the, of the hatch, and then you, you switch on the neutrons and uh, you measure what's going on. So you have two windows here. This is a special sample cell. So it's not the usual standard sample cell that is used for uh, neutron scattering and small angles. So this is a D22 instrument at ILL. And this is our uh, contact, our collaborator, Anne Mattel, who developed this system here. So it's a joint uh, device that allows you both to measure the scattering of the neutrons of your system. But then there's a second window when you put the, the, the quad cell where, with the sample in it, which allows you to follow the fluorescence. Okay, so there's UV light, you, you excite the system, and then you, you, you look at what's, coming, what's uh, coming back as fluorescent signal. And you measure this in parallel. So what comes out in the experiment? You can uh, then fit the signal and you, you, you get an, an information. You get a, a time scale for the disappearance here of the native GFP signal. You have a disappearance of the fluorescence and an exponential decay. And you have a buildup of, of aggregates. So if you look at the different curves at the very beginning, so this is 45 seconds because we have a 15 second delay to run out of the hatch. This is not yet fully automated with robots and so on. So the first uh, try. And then we have 30 second exposure time. So this is a signal after 40, uh, 30, 45 seconds, the, the red curve corresponding to this one. It's pretty close to the, to the natively folded GFP. So you can fit it again with some programs and you see it at very uh, at the beginning of the reaction, the, the GFP is native, in the native state. But then as you uh, follow over time, so all 30 second frames, exposure frames, and then going uh, through the action up to 50 minutes, which was the maximum time we had per sample, you see that the protein unfolds and aggregates, okay? So the mass of the object increases. You can see this by the change in I0 intensity, but also the, the shape of the curve changes over time. And then you can reconstruct this low resolution model. And you see that the GFP is being unfolded, but then being unfolded in no longer refolds correctly. And then there may be hydrophobic patches maybe at the surface, and then it will, will aggregate in these uh, pearl-like um, chains. So we can characterize with this over time, what is the, the rate of the reaction, how strong and quickly it, it aggregates. So the important thing is, you may heard that neutron scattering is low, but at this high flux um, instrument, we were able to go down to, to 30 second exposure times and getting still very decent data sets that allow to do some modeling. Now, we see that the uh, GFP aggregates with a certain rate, okay? This is not surprising. We have only unfold us. We don't have the other partner. Now, what is going on with the PAN system? The PAN system over time, again, you have here the initial state at around 45 seconds, then an intermediate state around five minutes, and then uh, the state at the end of the reaction, uh, 50 minutes. And you see the, the sun's curves, they are slightly different. So the I0 intensity is the same. This means the object keeps its um, oligomeric state, but the slope at the beginning changes. The slope is related to the, to the rate of duration, as you will learn with uh, Susanna. So it means at the beginning of the reaction, the, the, the particle is in the resting state. 
in a relaxed state, then during the action, while it unfolds the, the GFB, it will contract. So there are some conformational motions. And at the very end of the reaction, when the ATP is consumed and the GFB is completely unfolded, it goes back to its resting state. So if you plot the radius of duration, which is a measure of the extension of pan particle over time, you start at the resting state about around 66 angstroms, a radius of duration, you go down to a contracted version, which is the working complex at 60 angstroms, and then it relaxes back once the ATP is consumed and GFP is unfolded to the initial resting state. All this together in the first publication on this limited part of the system, we were able to come up with a certain model. So you have the initial um, setup of the, of the sum, you have the pan particle here symbolized, you have the fluorescent the GFP particles. It will interact, it will, um, it will then be uh, transferred across the channel of the pan, it will unfold, it may maybe refold partially, but not completely and be then reaction prone. So over time, there will these um, um, GFP aggregates that build up. So this is the first project. Now we come, of course, to the question, what happens if you add the actual, if you have the hollow complex as it works in, in, in an organism, okay? So you have both the unfolders, the pan complex, but you have also now the peptidase core particle, which act, takes into charge these uh, unfolded chains of the substrate and cuts it into these oligomeric pieces. Now, this is the second part of uh, second PhD uh, thesis from Emily Mayeux, which was my student two th years ago at, at, uh, at IBS. And we also did again the experiments at ILL and D22 on the same device I showed. So here again, you have uh, now the information, the structural information. You have the, of course, you need somewhere also a reference. What happens to GFP alone at 55 degrees Celsius, which is a relatively elevated temperature? You have to be sure that GFP does not thermally unfold. So this is why we have also all these reference curves here at the deuterated GFP alone at 55 degrees Celsius during 45 minutes. You see essentially nothing happens. That's reassuring because it means GFP alone in solution does not unfold spontaneously. Everything that's happening is really the, the consequence of the presence of the complex. Now, this is what essentially what I showed before. This is just a control experiment, the GFP hydrogenated pan. You don't see the pan signal. What you see here is really what actually happens to GFP during the reaction. You see again, this is a log log plot now. Before it was a log linear plot. So it looks a little bit different, but the, it's the same message. It unfolds over time, okay, and aggregates over time. Now the interesting part is here, okay? So you have um, here, what's going on? You have both PAN and uh, 20S particle, this core particle here present, okay? It's called 20S, it comes from sedimentation coefficient. Now what happens to the signal over time? You see the signal goes down, but there is no change in slope, not a significant change in slope, and there's no aggregation, no increase in intensity. It's a decrease in intensity. So the signal of the GFP part becomes weaker. What does it mean? It becomes weaker. This means part of the population of GFP disappears. And then there's a second feature here. Is at higher angles. So the red curve, you see also the, the, the data at higher angle. The red curve here is here. And the black curve, it goes, <clears throat> the signal goes down at low angles, but it comes up at higher angles. Now, what does it mean? It goes down at lower angles means that GFP, the natively folded particle, disappears. The fact that it comes up at higher angles means, remember the reciprocal relationship. When you look at high angles, it means it's something small in real space. This means if the signal increases at, uh, at higher angles here, it means that something small is appearing during the reaction. So in summary, it means if you have the hollow complex, GFP uh, disappears over time, the native GFP, there's no formation of aggregates, which is very important because imagine during this process, of destruction of proteins, you would have the formation of aggregates in your cells, it would be disastrous. And you have small objects that appear. Of course, these small objects are nothing else but the uh, polypeptides, the oligopeptides that is, appear here. So I go in detail in this now. Now, in addition to, if you want to model this now over time, you need some idea what are these, um, these, um, these small objects, the, the products of the reaction, and you do some mass spec. So you have some kind of distribution of lengths of, of these oligopeptides. It's not a single species, it's several species of the order of a couple of kilodaltons to maybe uh, something like uh, a, a 
10 mer or 15 mer, okay? Of course, you can also inspect on a macroscopic level what you saw now on the individual macromolecular level, you can look at a macroscopic level. So you have to look at the actual samples. You see here, these are these quartz -Kiverts. You have the neutron window here, you have the UV illumination here. This is isolated GFP, it's a green solution. Well, it's green fluorescent protein, that's how it should look like. Then this is the intermediate thing. So you have the DGFP at only pan unfolding, remember aggregates. Aggregates in the sun sample, they look like troubled, uh, like milky, um, opaque uh, solutions. That's exactly what's, what's happening here. So you have this milky solution, this is, you see the aggregates already by the light scattering. In the case of you have DGFP, HPAN and 20S, the holo system, well, there are no aggregates, that's good. And the green fluorescence goes down. This means there's less green fluorescent protein. That's exactly what we saw. So on a macroscopic level, you, you have an agreement of what you see by eye to what you interpret at a, a macromolecular level. Then you have additional controls that the GFP really disappears with best on plots and so on. I, I won't go into details, but you will have a handout of the lecture. And if you like and you're interested, you can also read the, the, the publication. Now, how do we proceed now? We want to fit this data over time. So we have a native population of GFP, we have substrates, and we might have an intermediate state, something that is being in the course of being dragged. So the protein is un, 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 uh, how do you call this in English? Unspooled, I think. So you, you have something you tear, you, you, you unfold it. Now we can fit this. You can try to fit it with two populations, the scattering curves over time with this native structure, which you know, and then you take some average unfolded intermediate. Given the results from MASPEC, we chose a 10 mer You cannot fit a distribution of substrates. It's too, it's too much information for the level of quality which you have in the 30 second exposure times of the neutron. So there's a certain noise level, as you may appreciate if you look at these uh, gray curves, gray data sets. And ha having now a uh, distribution of substrate would be too much. So we chose somehow an average substrate, which we chose as a 10 mer based on our mass spec data. And we fitted the population of a folded GFP and of this uh, 10 mer uh, oligopeptide. Uh, and we have then certain populations of the program that is called oligomer. So it's here's the reference from the ATSAS uh, package at the uh, Dmitry Svergun's group at Hamburg, which you may know. So this is then how we, we follow this as a function of time. And of course, we follow also the ATP, but this, this we do, do offline. A second possibility is then you, fold, you fit three species. You fit GFP, a substrate, uh, sorry, a product, and some kind of intermediate structure, which we constructed a little bit uh, uh, quick and dirty from the cryo -M. So to have a rough idea on a part of the GFP that is still folded and the long unfolded thing. So what is the results of this? The results are here, okay? So you have here time axis, you take this uh, unfolded intermediate from, from a, a snapshot from cryo -M and construct it. So those different substrate, we, we somehow um, uh, put the, the GFP and took it out. So it's, it's, a, it's a construction just to have a rough idea on an object that would be that size and in that state. And then you fit the populations. So you see at the beginning, there is a lot of folded GFP. It goes down to a certain base level and then the substrate comes up. And here, the intermediate state is not so clear. So often it's zero, sometimes it's five, maximum 10%. So if it is there at a given time um, during time point during the, the process, it must be very lowly populated, okay? So it's a quick intermediate state. Now, what else do you see? Combining all this information, this is GFP alone. You have the IC intensity, which stays the same over time is a reference sample. The RG stays the same over time. There's a slight loss of uh, fluorescence, which is due to the, to the high temperature, but the, globally the GFP remains the same. Here again, uh, the RG goes up very quickly to aggregates. I0 goes up, aggregates. Fluorescence goes down because the GFP is being unfolded. Here's now the holo complex. GFP fluorescence goes down and very nicely hand in hand, the I0 intensity. This means as GFP disappears, the fluorescence disappears. And you see the, I, uh, the RG is more or less the same. There's a slight decrease because of course the RG is a mixture of the RG of the GFP, but also the small products. Now here's a summary of all what we measured. 
you have uh, the specific time ratios for the I0 for the disappearance of the GFP, which is measured by the, by the scattering curve by the I0. You have a certain time rate, which is roughly the same for the disappearance of the fluorescence for the folding state. You have a third time rate, which you measure offline, but under the same conditions as the SUNS experiments of the um, consumption of ATP. Okay, all three time rates are the same. And you have a fourth time rate, which comes from this oligomeric fit, which is a little bit lower here, okay? So this is the global picture. And you can kind of come up with a global interpretation then of all this. And I have one or two minutes to go and then, then I'm done. So this is the mechanism we propose on this. You have a certain transitory interaction of the GFP substrate with the complex. At this stage, you can still dissociate. Nothing happens, no problem for the cell. But once you have this uh, unfolding process engaged over a point of no return, it's no longer possible that there's dissociation. So we interpret this as the GFP being unfolded, being dragged across the central channel, but keeping the two partners, the PAN and the 20S together, which is very important, extremely important, because if you had the liberation here of, uh, of unfolded intermediate, aggregation prone intermediates, it would be a catastrophe to yourself. So we could show by the suns, which is very extremely sensitive to aggregation, that this doesn't happen, the assembled process, works very nicely. And the third message is that the unfolded intermediate must be very, very transient of the order of five, a few percent maximum. So the unfolding process going through the channel, intermediate state is extremely quick. Now there are some offline characterizations, very important again, biophysical and so on and so on. But maybe last two slides, could this have been measured by SACS? It's very important, so X-rays. I was saying X-rays are sensitive to electron densities. Average electron density for 20S, PAN and GFP are the same. Problem is PAN and 20S particles together, they are one megadalton and the GFP is 28 kilodaltons. So you can calculate this uh, in silico, what this same mixture we had in suns would have produced in X-rays, okay? And the black curve would have been the average curve of all three partners in these given concentrations together. And what you will actually want to look at is the, signal from the GFP. Signal from GFP is this green curve. And you see here if mathematician or physicist, you know this logarithmic curve, these are two orders of magnitude. So the signal of the overall mixture is 100 where the signal of GFP is one. So it's completely, would have been completely impossible by Sachs to look at what's going on to the GFP in this complex mixture. The other way around, it would have been the same if you want to look at PAN in the presence of a very large aggregate here, Pan, it's again more than order of magnitude of difference. You could never have observed what's going on on the conformation changes in Pan if you ha have at the same time the GFP aggregates forming in a Sachs experiment. And only do it with neutrons. And this also again a, a paper for my for my student. So that's it. My conclusions. Time resolved suns allows you nowadays, and I hope the same will be the case at the ESS once it's uh, completely operational to allow the sub-minute range. So we are hopefully also with the checks at five seconds. Of course, at one stage, if you go to one second, two seconds, the signal becomes so noisy that you no longer can fit a real form factor. You may get a radius situation, but you can no longer fit models. So there's some limit, of course. We'll see how far ESS will go. I hope they will go very far in these time-resolved experiments. I'm very optimistic about this. Now you can combine this also with uh, online spectroscopy. It's very important to complement in these complex biophysical uh, systems with other techniques uh, uh, in addition to neutrons. You get insight in this dynamic process of important biological systems. It's not only the PAN system I was showing. There are a lot of biological systems that use this ATP or other things and have a time uh, evolution. It's complementary to static techniques like cryo and crystallography, also to solution like NMR. And it's important, of course, for, for your neutron expands to select an adapted biological system. And it's also extremely important to have a good D-Lab to have the, the correct uh, deuteration that you want in your system. This is thanks to all the people involved. It's a collaboration mainly between ILL IVS. We had some funding from ANR. So our local contact and collaborator is Anne Martel with all these nice sample devices she's developing in 22. We're also very grateful to D-Lab, in particular to Martin Moulin, who produced the samples. And these are my students, Ziad Ibrahim, Emilie Mayeux, who did the work. All these nice systems were developed by, by Bruno Fonsetti, which is a group leader in our group. 
And we had also the TED system here, which was from another student uh, from Alex Apolea before. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, so there, there is a question actually. So Ying Hu says, why high flux is needed for kinetic? Yeah, high flux means, you see, you have a, a, a 28 kilodalton uh, system. You have a few milligrams per milliliter. You have a solvent scattering. So the signal from the suns, uh, from a suns facility usually is, un unfortunately, it's not the same as for, for synchrotron. Synchrotron, in principle, the shots we did in 30 seconds here, you would have done them probably in, in 100 milliseconds or something like that. Problem is, as you said, there is no, um, there is no, um, how to say, resolution. You cannot see what you want to see because you have no labeling in SACS. And then the second point is also X-rays are destructive on your sums. If you do illuminate such a sample during seconds and seconds in uh, the SACS facility, it would, would be impossible. So it would degrade the system. So you need high flux neutrons. Um, if you go, I mean, there was formerly, um, facilities like LLB and so on, which is a very nice facility. But I think this kind of time resolved study with 30 seconds of resolution would not have been possibly with a medium flux uh, Newton facility. So high flux is important. You can do it at ILL. You may do it probably at, at FRM2 and things like that. Uh, I hope really that in the future you can do nice things like that at ESS also. So you need this high flux for these very weakly scattering biological systems. Neutrons are much more sensitive to, to metals and things like that. So if you have, if you study magnetism, material sciences and things like that, or you can go to systems with very high concentration. So here we have two mix per mil. Huh? It's about a promil of the volume of your sample is the, is, is the, is the actual macromolecule. Of course, there are systems you can go to 10% of volume fraction. You have 100 milligrams per milliliter, but then it's unphysiological concentrations and, and it's not the real um, one you want in your sample. So I think it's very important for these time resolved studies to have these high flux facilities. If you do it in static mode and with medium flux, you would measure such a sample for, for half an hour. And since the typical, typical time rates involved here are of the order of minutes, you need this very high flux. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Frank, for uh... Uh, a very excellent uh, presentation. It's very fascinating that you actually can can learn something for the structural ev evolution of the system. And also you showed very nicely how to combine different techniques. And uh, that's that's also a key for for uh, what we are doing with, with neutrons. We need a complementary technique and we should use neutrons to really pinpoint uh, the chain DC structure that you can't get with any other technique. So, so it was very nice. Uh, so I so guess, I mean, just to say, uh, the there will be hands out, hands out with the with the reference and everything. And I guess you'll also give the maybe the email address of the speakers to the to the students. I'm not sure. So um, feel free to also write me an email if the students like to. So. Right.